morning, everyone. I have to say these lights are really bright. <laughs> um, it's, it's great to be here with all of you at the World Medical Innovation Forum. And um, you know, the focus over these three days is on gene and cell therapy, but we didn't think we could bring back this group in person two plus years into the pandemic and not spend some time talking about COVID. So uh, this panel, uh, and we have four outstanding experts to whom I will pose some questions. This panel will uh, pivot away from gene and cell therapy and talk about life with COVID. So let's start with the outlook, the epidemiology, and I'm gonna ask our speakers to introduce themselves as, they, as I turn to them rather than taking the time to introduce them now. So here we are entering the third year of the pandemic. The world is shifting to a new strategy, one of living with COVID rather than living in fear of COVID. So what will the coming year look like? Can we expect another surge? Will the mitigation uh, features of this year be different than those we've had previously? And let's start uh, with Dr. Erica Chenoy, please. So a uh, brief introduction. I'm an infectious diseases physician at Mass General, and I do infection control as well. So I, I think about the next year in th three kind of facets. First would be, what does a surge actually mean? Because each surge has been a little bit different. Two, are we going to head towards a timing phase where it might go into more of a seasonal distribution? Maybe not this year, maybe in the future. And the last piece really relates to what does it mean in terms of living, which is how disruptive is it to our society writ large? On the first part, what does a surge look like? Well, each one has been slightly different. And what's really been really salient about the last several months has been this split from cases in the community to the impact in terms of severe disease, hospitalization, and death. And that's really a huge uh, kind of step forward. But it still means that there is virus circulating in the community. Fortunately, there is both uh, natural immunity with some of the estimates at greater than 60% of the American population being immune, higher amounts in children. And then there's obviously vaccines that have, have contributed amazingly to that. Add to that the ability to um, have therapeutics to prevent um, hospitalization, and then uh, some intrinsic, less severe variants that we've been you know, fortunate in some ways to have. So, so the surges are gonna look different, and this is all with the caveat that we don't have a variant that you know, escapes, completely escapes, but absent that, I think they're gonna look quite different. Whether or not they end up being seasonal, like the endemic coronaviruses that we've lived with for a very long time, I think is a question out there, and that would certainly make it easier to manage. But the last piece is the management, which is that with a minimum of five days of isolation for every case, plus uh, figuring out exposures, it's very disruptive in the workplace, in our personal lives, um, and in schools. Um, and so that piece of it, I think, is uh, to be determined in terms of how that will all sort itself out. Let me ask uh, Dr. Paul Bittinger to weigh in next. Sure, thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be here. I'm Paul Bittinger. I'm the Chief Preparedness and Continuity Officer uh, for the Mass General Brigham System. And, I, building on what Erica, I think, was saying is, is I think we, we're in an important phase where we have to pivot from focusing on purely case numbers or community prevalence to really think about health impact both for individuals and, and for society. Um, we have seen a, a dramatic shift in um, the association between infection and severe illness, uh, between infection, uh, sorry, uh, vaccinations and boosters. We've, we've really seen a dramatic decrease in the morbidity and mortality, how much people uh, are at risk of hospitalization or going to the intensive care unit or even dying. Uh, and then, as Erica mentioned, with therapeutics, uh, the ability early to test people and get them medicines that can decrease their uh, chance of being hospitalized or having a bad outcome by, by 80 to 90 percent, it really changes, I think, how we are living with COVID. Um, of course, the great uh, wild card uh, with COVID uh, remains what will happen with the, the evolution of variants. Uh, I think what we have now uh, is not what we're going to see in three months, six months, et cetera. But, but I think we, we know for sure we will see rises and, and, and decreases in overall number of cases, prevalence uh, over the years, and may or, it may or may not settle into a seasonality. But, but if we can really focus on preventing severe illness, preventing hospitalization, uh, obviously preventing death, um, it will change, I think, how we, how we live with COVID um, and, and allow the, the impact to be much less. Let's hear on this topic from Ms. Helen Branswell. 
Hi, I'm Helen Branswell. I'm a reporter at STAT. I hope you all know what STAT is, but if you don't, it's a Boston-based health news website. Um, we're affiliated with the Boston Globe. I cover infectious diseases at STAT and have uh, been covering infectious diseases for a long time. I started covering COVID in uh, the first days of 2020, as a matter of fact. Um, I agree with what the previous speakers have said. I think, you know, um, we are in a different phase. We've gotten to a place where there is enough immunity acquired through infection and through vaccination or a combination for some people, uh, where this is just not as threatening to us as it was before, although there certainly are a bunch of people who are still uh, unvaccinated, a lot of people who are still unvaccinated. And, um, you know, one of the things I think about when I think about where we're heading is how long the immunity we've acquired is gonna last and how well it will hold up, um, you know, so far. It's clear that we can't protect ourselves against mild infections with these vaccines. Also, people who've been infected before can be reinfected, clearly. Uh, but, you know, as Paul was saying, the uh, protection against um, uh, severe diseases seems to be holding up very well. We will see over time how long that holds up and also how well um, in protection from previous infection holds up against severe disease. And um, so we're just going to have to watch that space to see where this thing goes. So all of you were very uh, diplomatic about the million dollar question here, and that is, what are the chances that the next variant or the one after that eludes the protection that we all have from vaccination or that many of us have from prior infection? That's, I think that's the million dollar question here. Who wants to actually take a swing at that question? I'll, I'll go ahead and take a stab. I'm uh, Daniel Kariskas. I'm Chief of Infectious Diseases at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital. I th think the reality is we, we simply don't know. Um, right now, what we're seeing with Omicron and all the different BA uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, whatever number you want, is that the virus now seems to be exploring a particular evolutionary niche where instead of new variants popping up out of nowhere, uh, it's uh, refining itself around the Omicron variant. But historically, what has happened is that a new, completely different variant has emerged from some corner of the world and, and then taken over. And we don't yet have the ability to predict what those will look like in the way that we do uh, with influenza. Uh, and so I think we have to be prepared that there could be something completely different that emerges. And while it's clear that we're much better equipped to deal with COVID-19 now than we were certainly at the beginning of the pandemic and even uh, a year ago. Uh, Omicron, in many ways, was far more disruptive uh, because it was so contagious. We had more people out on my staff during January and February. We had more people in the hospital uh, in, at the Brigham uh, during January and February with uh, um, COVID, although not necessarily because of COVID. And that in itself caused uh, huge strains, even though very few of those people, fortunately, were severely ill enough to be in the intensive care unit. So uh, unfortunately, there's no better uh, way of knowing what's going to happen until we see what actually transpires. Let's turn to uh, vaccine development. Um, there's little doubt that the mRNA vaccines have been an incredible asset in containing and controlling the pandemic. Um, is the likelihood of a universal COVID vaccine a real thing? Uh, can we expect a, a vaccine that could put COVID in a corner the way vaccination puts measles in a corner? Or are we really looking at annual or semi-annual boosters that get modified over time the way the influenza vaccine uh, appears to need to be done? And let's start with Paul on that one. So I think one of the most important uh, questions to ask is, is what's the purpose of vaccination right now with where, where we are uh, in the pandemic. And, you know, building a little bit on, on actually what Helen uh, mentioned, um, so far we've seen great durability in protection against severe illness and death, uh, even from the original uh, vaccines. It's, it, it's interesting, I'm thrilled to be here at the, at the World Medical Innovation Forum because the last time I was here in person, I was fortunate to be on a panel uh, with Rochelle Walensky and, and Stefan Bansell from, from Moderna. Um, and we were just at that point talking about the potential promise of, of mRNA vaccines. And we've clearly recognized, we've realized what they can do for limiting severe illness and death. They can be tailored relatively quickly in a matter of weeks uh, to 
um, I, I, to adapt to new strains, but I think if, if our goal is, is mostly to try and vaccinate so that we prevent severe illness and death, I, I do think um, we already are most of the way there for that. Clearly, uh, as again was already mentioned, where we are not is being able to prevent illness overall. And I think Erica mentioned very nicely how disruptive it is just to have infection. It takes you out of work for five days at least, if not 10. Um, it's very disruptive to the workplace. And so I, I think there are a lot of people working on this concept of a, a universal COVID vaccine, something that really could lower the incidence of um, illness overall, not just severe illness and death. Um, and we're gonna learn a lot more in the next few months uh, about some of the trials of, of either hybrid approaches to vaccination or just different molecular targets overall for vaccination. Dan, do you agree with that or do you have a different view? Uh, I, I think that uh, we are going to have new vaccines. I, I think that I certainly agree with uh, uh, what Paul said, that the main thrust in vaccination today is preventing severe illness, not necessarily preventing infection or mild illness per se. Uh, to get to a more universal vaccine, we're going to have to look at different targets. I don't think you're going to have a universal vaccine based on the spike protein, whether that is nuclear protein or some uh, a combination of viral proteins. It's going to have to be a very different uh, kind of uh, vaccination, and it's not clear that we can get there. I, I would put my money more on the likelihood that we'll have annual vaccination, much like we have annual vaccination for influenza. Helen, what are your thoughts on this? I think one of the things that we have to think about when we're looking to the future and, and what kinds of vaccines might be available to us is the, how much it would cost to bring new vaccines to market. Uh, one of the reasons, not one of the reasons, the reason we have multiple uh, very successful vaccines this early in, a, in an event, because this is very early, um, you know, we are extremely lucky, but the previous administration um, devoted, I think it was $18 billion for Operation Warp Speed, which really uh, de-risked the whole enterprise for the pharmaceutical industry. Without that money, this we would not be where we are today. And um, that money isn't, you know, is congressional funding for COVID measures is uh, drying up. It's, you know, we may find ourselves with the science that says, we can do better than this, but without the money to actually do it. And, you know, if the pharmaceutical companies are selling something that is adequate enough, it's going to take more than just some good results to get us to a better vaccine. That's an interesting perspective. Thank you. Let's turn to therapeutics. So the mRNA vaccines were developed really quickly. They've been wildly successful, as we've talked about, in preventing severe illness. Developing therapeutics has lagged a bit. It's been a little harder. Uh, why has it been harder to develop and deploy them? Is this expected? You know, is, are you surprised by this? And let's start with Dan. You no, know, it has always been hard to develop therapeutics for respiratory infections. And the reason is that these agents work best when given within the first couple of days of illness. And so it's really a race between the virus and uh, the, the clinician to be able to administer the therapeutic as early as possible. We know with influenza that uh, the best results are uh, obtained when you treat within the first uh, day or so uh, of symptoms. And with influenza, it's pretty clear when you get sick. You know you have sudden onset of high fever, headache, muscle aches and pains, and, and during flu season, you can be certain you have flu. We can't be that certain with uh, COVID-19. And so there's a several day delay and that dilutes the impact of, of the therapeutics. The other issue is one that uh, relates in part to what Dr. Califf was saying in the previous session. We need to get much better at developing a nationwide infrastructure where we can mine hospital data uh, so that we can obtain the information necessary to validate the uh, efficacy of uh, investigational therapeutics in a way that this country has lagged far behind what's been done in England and in uh, parts of the European continent. If you look at some of the large platform trials that they've had, uh, which really drove the therapeutics field forward uh, early on with uh, dexamethasone uh, and uh, showing certain therapies that were ineffective long before uh, we were able to start with the trials of uh, of nermatrelvir, ritonavir, and, and other uh, uh, subsequently approved therapeutics. Erica, what's your perspective on this? Yeah, I would just add that in addition to the, the piece around early identification, linking that to treatment, has been that the treatment um, landscape continues to shift. 
Um, and that ties into surveillance for new variants and whether or not the, uh, the treatments will remain effective against them but also really understanding that from the clinician point of view, um, from one week to the next, uh, there can be changes in how you might prescribe these. And when you, um, previously when it might be a smaller group or a, a, a specialty that's prescribing medications, that can be uh, incorporated, but we're talking about treating large numbers of patients. It's falling on the um, plates of primary care, infectious disease, lots of groups that have to be kind of re-educated re pretty frequently about the risks and the benefits, drug-drug interactions. There is a lot there that goes into uh, prescribing a medication. And so when you add that to the diagnostic delay, the treatment, then accessing the treatment, um, we can do better and we have to do better in order to actually capture the benefit, which is reducing the risk of severe disease in those who are at most vulnerable. I'm struck by the comment that Helen made earlier about vaccine development, and I'm wondering whether anyone has a thought about whether the, uh, let's say, the slower development of therapeutics has been limited by funding in a way that vaccine development initially wasn't. I, I think it's, it, it has, uh, and I think the other um, development that's been uh, slow that goes hand in hand is, is actually diagnostics. Um, you know, as, as Dan mentioned, uh, with respiratory viral illnesses, we know that, that early treatment is extremely important, and getting people to go and get a diagnostic test early when their symptoms are quite mild has been hard because it's logistically difficult. The tests don't, don't have the, the same sensitivity specificity that we want. And, I don't think we can have the robust therapeutic approach that, that we are striving for unless we pair that with diagnostics at the same time. We have to make it really easy either for patients on their own, and we do, we've seen finally an explosion with that with antigen tests, but for clinicians as well to have high reliability, high sensitivity and specificity tests that, that are very easily available. And, and I think funding for both the diagnostics and therapeutics has to expand. I think we have to really support that better at the federal level um, uh, for us to, to make those, those last inroads into, into limiting severe illness. You know, we haven't really talked much about uh, testing, and we hadn't planned to, but, it, but it's come up in a couple of questions in the, in, the, uh, in the chat, and a couple of you have brought it up. Um, and getting back to the outlook, our future, is our future to test before we go to large events? Does anyone want to take that one on? I think that's an interesting perspective. Uh, we're having a dinner tomorrow evening of the chiefs of uh, the different uh, services uh, within the Department of Medicine between Mass General and the Brigham, and we've all been asked to test before we come in order to be safe uh, at dinner. Uh, so uh, I can see that uh, in certain settings uh, being more common, whether that continues to be an issue for international travel, for example, uh, is, is going to be an open question. Uh, I think that um, uh, testing uh, is far preferable to uh, uh, lockdowns and mandatory isolation, uh, and we have the tools. We ought to learn how to apply them wisely. Erica, did you want to add something? Yeah, I would say that um, this is an interesting area to follow because testing from an infection prevention point of view is never considered a prevention strategy. Um, vaccines are clearly a prevention strategy. Distancing, these are kind of prevention strategies. I mean, I think there is a place, but if we try to anchor ourselves into the way we treat other respiratory viruses, we don't test people who are asymptomatic. We rarely test exposed individuals, even to the most proximate virus here, flu, in terms of severity. And so if we are gonna go this way, it's a very different framework. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, I'm not sure that we will end up there, but um, you know, it, it's, it's part of the armamentarium, and what we're, we're really feeling our way through right now is which parts do we keep, which do we put kind of in the background and then bring out on occasion as we need them. Can I just add, you know, one of the, one of the things about testing is, is that, or any of these tools for that matter, is that, um, you know, we have a much better idea of what works and how to use them. But there are parts of the country that will not use them. And, you know, if you want to talk about testing in front of, in, in advance of a big event, you may have no problem doing at a medical conference, but there will be parts of the country in which if you ask people to test before they come to, to take part in a, I don't know, a tailgate party for a football game or something, you know, you're going to have problems on your hands. I mean, 
one, it was referred to, in fact, in, in the uh, session with Dr. Califf earlier, I mean, there is the politicization of COVID. It has ramifications that are going to sort of ripple out for years to come. And, and I think, you know, just because we have these tools doesn't mean we're going to use them as well as they could be used. Thank you. Let's uh, look at COVID through the lens uh, of, a global, uh, of the global pandemic that it is. We've talked a lot about uh, local control and, and maybe we've looked at it through a national lens, but um, will we really be able to control COVID in this country if we don't have a global approach to vaccination and treatment? Uh, let's start on that one with Erica. So th there's no doubt that uh, this is a glo global pandemic, but most um, infectious diseases at this point, they're not relegated to any corner of the world. They will travel with uh, their reservoirs, either human or animals, and they'll make their way around the world. So the vaccination strategy has to be a global strategy. Um, that's not just uh, an imperative because it's the right thing to do, that we need to ensure that uh, vaccines are available and accessible, but also because we need to be able to maintain uh, the ability to go between um, countries and to um, address the fact that, you know, while variants can arise here, they can also arise anywhere. Um, uh, so I would say it is a global strategy, and that also introduces complications because there can be hyper-local epidemiology that um, will not be addressed potentially by every vaccine that's available. So I think as we look forward, uh, vaccine development could get very complicated um, as there are uh, variants that kind of take through the world at different, uh, different paces and different stages. Dan, can we get your thoughts on this, please? Yeah, I, I agree with what uh, Erica has been saying. I, I think this is clearly a, a global pandemic. It requires uh, global solutions. We can't uh, begin to get the world economy back on track, uh, even uh, without the disruptions ha happening in Europe now, without control of disease on a global scale. Look at what's happening in China. If China can't have Shanghai open because of concerns around COVID, the Chinese economy can't function, and therefore the supply chain continues to be uh, disrupted. Uh, at the same time, we need to be putting our own house in order before we attempt to uh, put the rest of the world in order. Uh, it was frankly disgraceful that we cut off travel from South Africa when the Omicron variant uh, emerged in December uh, because we were a country that had failed to vaccinate uh, 20 to 30 percent of its population, where large swaths of the population refused to do anything to protect their neighbors and, the, and their loved ones, let alone themselves, and yet we were quick to close the door. It, when it was clear that the variant was already here. So we need better global coordination for how we uh, address the pandemic and can't expect that uh, we're going to somehow be an island or, or, or be uh, sheltered from emergence of uh, new strains and, uh, and uh, new variants uh, anywhere in the world. And they will find their way here regardless of what measures we impose locally. So we've answered the question from a health policy standpoint and from an infectious disease standpoint, but I'd like you to think a little bit about answering the question from a health equity standpoint. Um, resource utilization, access to treatment, access to vaccination. If it's a global problem, should there not be a global solution? Who wants to take that one on? Well, I'll, I'll give it a start. I, I think it, it sort of follows on from our previous discussion. Um, I, I think that there needs to be a global commitment of and the countries that have the resources uh, to help uh, provide uh, uh, access, whether it's through appropriate licensing for local manufacture, whether it's through financial support of uh, infrastructure that allows for administration of vaccination. We have models for how that's done. Uh, this was done uh, with the uh, uh, President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, which had a dramatic impact on AIDS mortality around the world. Uh, it was, it's been done in places for malaria eradication. It was done for the eradication of river blindness. So we have models. I think we need to get more imaginative about how we do this in a way that protects intellectual property, uh, uh, doesn't bankrupt uh, the uh, donor countries, uh, but is able to scale uh, in a meaningful way uh, the distribution of uh, important preventive measures uh, around the world. Helen, did you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I, I, you know, on the one hand, it, you know, it's clear that 
distribution of vaccine globally has not been equitable. Um, wealthy countries have given fourth doses before some countries have vaccinated 10% of their populations. And when we're talking about 10%, we're talking about people at high, high risk. Um, that isn't fair. On the other hand, um, there has been enormous progress made in a very short period of time. Uh, probably by the end of this year, I think, the, the, um, most countries will have as much vaccine as they want to, to deploy. I mean, certainly there are a number of low-income countries that have no plans to vaccinate their entire populations, maybe no, won't even vaccinate 50% of their population. But there are efforts underfoot and have been for quite a long time through um, the, uh, uh, in, uh, excuse me, the agency that has call, is called COVAX, which is, uh, was created by the World Health Organization, CEPI, uh, Gavi, uh, to, to try to access vaccine and, and distribute vaccine. You know, they've run into lots of problems. Among other things, the, the uh, pharmaceutical companies prefer to sell to countries than they do to COVAX, so, so getting access to some of the vaccines has been an issue. Uh, and getting access to supplies to vaccinate or is, has also been an issue. So, you know, there may be enough doses, but there may not be the right syringes or the cold chain in some countries hasn't been adequate to administer, for instance, the mRNA vaccines. Um, it is a work in progress, but it is, it, there have been some significant successes that I think that we don't recognize often enough, to be honest. All right, let's talk now as we wind down this panel about the impact on healthcare systems. So the stress on healthcare systems in the US has really been unprecedented. I don't think we need to um, tell this audience that. Uh, it's had enormous operational and financial impacts on health systems, and it's had enormous impact on healthcare workers, uh, mostly bad, and that, that impact will persist beyond the active phases of the pandemic. So, I'd like your perspectives on what we can do to build resilience into our healthcare systems and what we can do to be better prepared for the next stressor, whether it's a pandemic or something else. And Paul, given your role, why don't we start with you? Sure. So, so I think th there really are several different things that we really need to be focusing on. I think, you know, clearly uh, COVID is not the latest emerging infectious disease threat that we're going to face. Uh, and, and we really need to be much more, uh, I think, broad thinking rather than try and only target strategies at what we specifically faced in the COVID pandemic. Um, the CDC has an, an, uh, a model that we often use of identify, isolate, and inform uh, in order to pick up new emerging infectious disease threats that may be that next pandemic. And you know, right now we're seeing new strains of influenza uh, that, that have the potential uh, to, to uh, potentially further mutate and, and become uh, pandemic strains. There, there are lots of other things out there. Identify means we have to have a much better system for recognizing those symptoms, those travel risk factors, others um, early so that we can isolate patients, meaning take them out uh, of, of the general population, out of the waiting room, out of the, the, the emergency department or clinic, and, and, and figure out whether they have the illness. To isolate someone effectively, you need a few different things. We need a much, much better approach to personal protective equipment. Obviously, everyone is extraordinarily aware of the supply chain challenges we had for personal protective equipment. But really, most of what we wear in medicine is, is actually adapted personal uh, protective equipment from the industrial world that we bring into the hospital. Um, we still have uh, a ways to go to come up with PPE that is easier to put on, easier to take off safely, um, is more comfortable to wear for hours on end, and, and can be manufactured more quickly. Um, we also need hospital systems that can do high-level isolation for other emerging infectious uh, disease threats that, that actually is different than what we, we've even had to do with COVID. There's an effort underfoot right now to develop something called the National Special Pathogen System, which is a tiered structure across the hospitals of, of the United States, where at different levels, hospitals have increasing levels of uh, infectious disease capability. Um, currently, there's only a small handful of hospitals that can do high-level isolation that are fully trained for the personal protective equipment uh, that, that we need to have. That, I think, is necessary for us to have much, much better pandemic awareness. In addition, I, I think just building on the last comment you said, is surge capacity, the ability of healthcare systems to uh, 
increase uh, rapidly when there's an increase in demand, and whether that's a pandemic or a mass casualty incident or some other cause, that's really hard. The US healthcare system is, is economically incentivized to run at the red line all the time. It has to basically run full uh, to, um, to operate effectively, but what that means is that when we have surges, we really struggle to accommodate that. And of course, we've seen this again and again uh, in the waves of the pandemic that we've experienced. So thinking about both the physical infrastructure, what are our rooms, what our hospitals look like, and in some ways, what are the economic incentives? How do we structure our medical staffing so that we can surge more effectively? All of those are enormously big topics. I don't say any of that lightly, but I think that's what we need to, to have much better resilience for future surges. Well, I'm glad you're thinking about this. Erica, did you want to ask, answer, yeah. add to that before I ask another question? I was just going to add, I, I agree with everything Paul said, and we work very closely on pandemic preparedness together. I think the other piece that I um, really took away from our experience over the last two years is that we can deliver care in many different environments, and that we focus a lot on the acute care setting, but we've really learned a lot about distributing and trying to get care in the right place at the right time to the patient. And that can, in some ways, be a real change in how we approach um, the delivery of care and put it in, in a more efficient location, but also, to, in some ways, to try to uh, decompress some of the pressures on acute care and really reserve the acute care setting for patients who really, really need it. So there's been lots of innovation in hospital care, in the home, home care extenders. And I think that is something that could build res resilience in the healthcare sector in a way that um, perhaps we were never really pushed to do. I mean, we had some programs previously and people were familiar with home care, but never to the extent as to what we have been able to do. And so to the extent that we can build on that and build uh, reserve, um, I think that would put us in a much better position for whatever next surge, um, infectious or otherwise, we might um, be faced to deal, uh, deal with. So I'm glad that both of you, all of you, are thinking about this. Um, I'll say that as a hospital president and as a healthcare system leader, what has kept me up at night has not been the question I asked earlier, which is, is it likely that a variant will elude, a variant of SARS-CoV-2 will elude um, the impact of the vaccines. What's kept me up at night is SARS-CoV-3, which doesn't exist right now, but imagine a SARS-CoV-3 virus that has the transmissibility of Omicron and the mortality of SARS-CoV-1, which we've conveniently forgotten about during the COVID pandemic, but was much more lethal. Is that uh, too depressing uh, to be thinking about? What does this group think about that? I, I think it's important that we consider that. I mean, don't forget, we had the beginnings of an Ebola pandemic uh, when there was d international distribution of Ebola cases from the uh, local epidemic that emerged uh, roughly a decade ago now. Um, and, and so I, I think all of the points that, that Paul and Erica made are critical in terms of being able to identify uh, new emerging infections and then being, having the physical uh, facilities to be able to uh, deal with them. It's essential that we invest in public health. The CDC at the federal level and all the state and local health departments have been decimated uh, by uh, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and its fallout, and they need to be rebuilt and we need to invest in them just as we need to invest in capacity and redundancy at the healthcare uh, system level it, it, in order to be able to have the flexibility to stretch when we need to. We have enormous capacity and enormous redundancy in our uh, military infrastructure, which we hope never to use, but we know over and over again we're going to need to use our healthcare infrastructure and we simply have failed to make the same investment. And, and I think two, two, two things uh, to add to that. I think number one, uh, historically we always have a boom-bust cycle in uh, preparedness activities, pandemic or infectious disease or otherwise. We saw it with the surge of focus in, in uh, Ebola that waned quickly with now focus on pandemics that, that is waning. We saw it previously with bird flu back in, in 2003 and four. Um, and we needed to smooth those surges out so that we don't have this unreliable infrastructure, unre unreliable uh, level of funding to support our, our readiness that we know we need. And, and I wanna come back again to diagnostics. I, I think. You know, what we've seen early in um, each of the pandemics, whether it was a novel influenza, whether it was e Ebola across the U.S., whether it was, uh, we didn't see Ebola cases across the U.S., but the Ebola concerns, and certainly we saw uh, with COVID, is just how hard it is, how long it takes to develop 
diagnostics that we can roll out across the country. And that really hampers our readiness if for weeks and weeks, potentially months uh, early in a pandemic, we have to send all of our samples to the CDC, and that takes days and weeks to figure out whether we have cases. Then, it, you know, slowly we roll out those diagnostics to state labs, and only months later can we figure out in the hospitals whether we have cases or not. We, we have to be able to develop novel diagnostics for these new diseases that are going to uh, emerge if we have any hope of controlling them early or limiting uh, the rate of spread in the community. Ellen, did you have? Yeah, thought? I'll just add quickly because I know we're, we're getting tight on time. I think you're smart to be worried about, you know, the next one because there will be a next one and, you know, as bad as this was, one was, we were lucky in some respects. Um, something else could be worse. One of the things that I really worry about is the fact that we succeeded so, you know, overwhelmingly with vaccines that I fear that people think that, okay, we can do this anytime now that we have the mRNA platform and we've, you know, worked out the bugs that this, you know, the next time something comes along, we'll just plug that in and, and, and there we go. We can't assume that the next pathogen will work as well in that platform or other platforms. Um, we can't assume it should be, it will be as easy to, to develop vaccines for another uh, pathogen. And so, you know, just as Paul was saying, we need to smooth out the, the preparatory work. We also have to keep investing in basic research because the reason um, SARS-2 vaccines were available so quickly was because of work that was started on SARS-1 vaccines after 2020, or, excuse me, 2003. Thank you. I think that takes us to the end of our session. We appreciate the chance to share some thoughts with you about the pandemic, living with COVID into its uh, third year.